Hi, everyone. Um, everyone that's sitting in the back can come a bit more to the front because it's way nicer for the lecture that it's everyone is sitting in the front. So please, the last two rows can go can come a bit more to the front. Yeah, thank you very much. Then I would like to give the word to Niels and Lena for, from Kahn and Cooper. They will give the lecture today. So thank you very much. Can everybody understand me correctly? Great. <laughs> yeah, it's flying. I'll just hold it. Um, well, hello, everyone. While you're enjoying your sandwich and the, and the drink, we would like to talk to you uh, about the company that we work for, Kahn & Cooper. Uh, and the subject of today's lecture is uh, data in complex projects. And we want to give you guys a project management perspective on, uh, on this matter. Uh, my name is Niels. Uh, I used to study here uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this faculty. I did a bachelor's in architecture and urbanism and a master's degree in construction management and engineering. I graduated last November, so that's still quite uh, recently, and started this January with Count & Cooper, where I'm currently considered as the ultimate starter, because I also did my graduation internship there. I was the job student, and before that, a regular intern, so I have quite uh, a history with the company already. Uh, and my job is a data analyst, so um, what I'm currently busy with is the dashboarding of all kinds of project management-related data, uh, and within those uh, dashboarding tasks, I'm also tasked with identifying um, generic management uh, processes. So it's a very interesting uh, job in which you learn quite a lot about how to manage a complex project. And this is uh, Lena. She's one of our current uh, job uh, students. Would you like to introduce yourself? So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lena. Uh, I've been working at Kouten Cooper since December, so not that long. Uh, and right now I'm studying here at the university as well. I study real estate and construction management and uh, at Counter Cooper I'm actually doing the 4D planning. So what this means is that you have a 3D model and uh, a planning and I'm the person that combines it. And uh, by doing that I can give a lot of extra insights that you normally wouldn't have. And uh, that's really valuable during uh, project management. And I'm doing that for the A9, so uh, the road that's going to uh, the Netherlands. And uh, it's being uh, reconstructed. Uh, so yeah, I'm really uh, having a lot of fun. And uh, I'll give the word back to Niels. That allowed me to make this a bit higher. Great. Um, first, some figures about uh, our company ourselves. Uh, we have been founded in 2013. So that's something that we are celebrating this year with uh, a trip to Madrid because we uh, exist for 10 years, so that's very nice. We're going there with the entire company, all 65 of us. Uh, apart from our 65 full-time employees, we have currently 17 job students, like Lena, uh, and we still have an ambition to grow. Only this year we want to uh, add 16 more uh, full-time employees to uh, our company, so uh, we're growing uh, very quickly. Um, what's our business? It's kind of separated in three uh, bullet points, as you can see on the slide. We would like to win tenders, and uh, we're actually quite good at it. Two out of three tenders that we participate in, we have a successful result, which is an incredibly high number. Um, next to that, we participate in the management of uh, mega projects or very complex projects, and that's something I'll elaborate on uh, a little bit later. And lastly, we want to be on the forefront of innovation within the built environment. As you might have already uh, seen in, in some of your lectures, uh, is that the built environment, as in general, is quite a rigid um, in, uh, industry. And what we would like to do is 
see if we can do things differently and not be scared to try to do things differently to actually uh, uh, make a difference on, uh, on projects. Um, so yeah, that's us. We're located with our office in Rotterdam, right next to the central station. As you can see by the blue square, we have a very nice roof terrace, uh, which we enjoy very much on our Fridays afternoon as well. Um, so we're very easily reachable by public transport. So uh, for me, I still live in Eindhoven uh, and uh, Lena as well. We're still there within the hour. So uh, that's very nice. Okay. So let's go into the contents of what we stand for as a company ourselves. As you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, news articles. Unfortunately, they're in Dutch. Sorry for that. Um, that there's currently so many construction projects going on, especially uh, with regards to infrastructure that have cost overruns, have lots of delays. So this is kind of the public perception towards such projects. And um, yeah, there's several reasons to that. Uh, mostly it's ambitious planning. Uh, it's also part of the tendering uh, process that everybody wants to have as quick as possible and as cheap as possible. But sometimes a tender wins, but they have plans which aren't even that feasible. Uh, but apart from that, um, this of course really sketches the, the importance of uh, companies like us, companies who are willing to do something differently, uh, because this of course is not the image that we want to have for Dutch construction uh, in the future. Um, so how do we do this? Um, we try to be reasonable and uh, we try to uh, take the attitude that we can't excel in everything. And that's just something that we should know about ourselves, is that we can't be good at construction, we can't be good at uh, uh, project management, we can't be good at risk management, we can't be good at uh, resource planning. All those different kinds of principles which are very, very important to a construction management, you can't excel in everything. So if there is some type of knowledge that we don't have, we either try to invest in it to gain it, and then we expand our company, or we just work together with some of our partners to actually uh, come up with a very decent and uh, good relationship uh, to actually kind of like gain that knowledge by that way. Um, next to that, of course, as I already mentioned, the technology plays a very big role in that part as well. Uh, next to that, just to get an uh, uh, idea of all the things that we do as a company, uh, we have all of our practices, which you see on the slide. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I'm currently part of the digital project management one, which is the first. Uh, our task is to uh, try to come up with new innovations, uh, which we can apply upon our projects. But uh, apart from that, we have contracting, financial control, but also stakeholder management. So it's quite diverse. Uh, but as you can see, it's not dealing with the actual construction or engineering itself. It's more with the uh, management of such projects. To give you an idea of the type of projects that we deal with, um, this one is the entree, which is the underwater bicycle garage in front of the uh, Amsterdam Central Station. Uh, it actually was recently opened, so you guys might have already seen it or uh, visited it. Um, what we did here was actually drain the entire lake in front of the station. We built the bicycle garage, then made it completely watertight, and then uh, actually let the water back in. Uh, and it's the first underwater bicycle garage in the world. So it's a project we're very proud of. Uh, just another picture of the actually finalized project. Uh, another project in Amsterdam is the, uh, the K-Wall renovation project. Actually, Amsterdam has over 200 kilometers of K-Walls, uh, which need to be replaced in the upcoming years or so. The municipality actually doesn't know it themselves, uh, what the status is of some of these K-Walls. And here we do actually the, the project management and the risk management uh, of, uh, of this project. And we're currently busy with three uh, walls, one on the Herengracht, one on the Gelderse Kade, and one on the uh, Keizersgracht, I believe. Lastly, we have uh, the A9 project, and this is the project where Lena is, uh, is part of. This is actually a 12 kilometer high, uh, long highway renovation uh, where we both broaden and deepen the highway. This highway used to split Amstelveen in two, uh, but now it's going from six, uh, six meters above ground to 12 meters below ground. Um, so, uh, and this actually allows us to create parks on top uh, to connect both sides of the city. So, uh, and next to that, uh, hopefully solve lots of the traffic jams which are currently happening uh, over there. So, 
These are some other projects which we previously uh, joined. One of which is the uh, finalization, for example, of the North-South line in Amsterdam. Oh. Um, but also uh, the forum building in Rotterdam. So it's quite diverse, actually. You can see its infrastructure, its buildings, uh, but it's al always has some type of complexity in it. Okay. Uh, finally, which is also something that's very interesting and a very interesting development uh, within our company, is that uh, in our new strategy, we try to focus more on incorporating the sustainable development goals um, in our project as well. So what we're currently also doing is trying to uh, uh, gain access to the market of uh, energy transition projects. We're currently busy with a tender which deals with floating solar farms. Uh, and there's also uh, a project going on which is uh, dealing with a tight uh, energy plant on the sea. So it's actually very uh, nice to also be part of that sector as well. So then we'll dive into the actual terminology of complexity. And I try to give you an, uh, a good explanation of it because it's quite an ambiguous term. It's quite, quite open to interpretation. So I'll try to take you through our, at least our definition of uh, complexity. And that is that within construction, we're currently uh, touching the boundaries of what's possible. Now you can see some very ambitious projects on the slide. Uh, we hope to participate in such projects one day. Um, and there's also, because these projects are so complex, so big, uh, uh, that there's also a lot of non, uh, parts involved. So that's something that we also have to take into account. So it's larger projects, more innovative projects, more partners involved. But next to that, we also are expected to work faster, make better bu buildings or better highways, but work cheaper. So we can bring that down to two figures. Chance of error increases because of this complexity, but the margin for error actually decreases. Because of course, if you make an error, it's either time overrun or cost overrun, but most of the time, it's both of them. And this brings us to our kind of core focus as a company um, in which we participate in the processes which are focused on gathering and analyzing project information and the corresponding data in which we try to manage cost, progress, and quality. So that's kind of what we stand for. And how are we trying to achieve that? This is by this uh, applying this triangle to everything that we do. We have our people on the projects, and these people should both be up to speed with the processes at hand, but next to that also be up to speed with the, all of the different types of technology, which are actually capable to aid uh, in such processes and aid such people. To give you some concrete uh, examples of what our, makes our projects complex, we sub subdivided them into two categories, uh, which are the categories of matter and skill. Uh, Matter complexity actually really applies to, for example, logistics. As you can, as you already had seen, we have the two projects in Amsterdam, which is a very high density neighborhood. There's lots of people living there. There's lots of tourists. Uh, actually, the Entre uh, project was next to the busiest part of the Netherlands. Um, so you can imagine that it's quite difficult to get all of your materials there uh, and also work safely. But next to that, you have uh, the context as general. Uh, in general, you have people living around it, you have other stakeholders, for example, in uh, the government or municipality. Um, you have to deal with specific types of machinery very often. And of course, there's risks at the end. And then the other side, if you look at scale, um, the actual quantities can also cause quite a lot of uh, problems. Or the amount of people living uh, close to a project can also cause quite some challenges, actually. The amount of subcontractors also. If you have to keep in touch with five subcontractors, that's quite doable. But on the uh, A9 projects, it's a lot more, I can tell you. Uh, this also poses the, uh, the challenge of simultaneous activities. So something um, like the K renovation project in Amsterdam, it's quite of a linear work. One thing follows after the other, and that's quite overseeable for a person. But if you have an A9 project, there's lots of things happening at the same time. So none of the times one person can actually uh, comprehend what is happening at that moment. So with this in mind, I want to take you to a specific case um, which kind of deals with this uh, complexity. And that case is nuisance for stakeholders, so people living uh, around uh, one of our projects. So how are we maintaining control? And then I want to uh, kind of compare a small project with a very complex logistic challenge with a large project 
which has a scale challenge. Now here we see actually uh, the Herengracht in Amsterdam. Um, it's highlighted. And within this uh, uh, canal, uh, we are actually replacing the cables. So uh, the things that we do are drilling, piling, and there's lots of large machinery which are in the water. Now, of course, are, there are uh, a couple of things that we can do to actually inform the people uh, surrounding this project. And with that, we have kind of a strategy that we first want to prevent nuisance. If that's, not in, if that's impossible, we want to mitigate the nuisance. Uh, and uh, finally, we can always compensate for the nuisance. So to give you an example for that, uh, we wanted to prevent the nuisance by actually uh, applying specialized machinery which is made for, uh, to fit the Amsterdam bridges, uh, because initially the project said, okay, yeah, we might have to remove some bridges to get the machinery in place. Of course, this is not possible in such a busy city as Amsterdam. So we prevent that by actually applying specialized and fit for purpose uh, machinery. Secondly, uh, of course, we have to drill some piles and we have to lift large uh, pieces of building materials. This can be very dangerous for people uh, living close to the building site. So what we actually did is that we installed uh, a traffic light within each, people, uh, each person's house close to the project, which is when it's turned red, they're not allowed to go outside of the door because it's unsafe outside. We can't prevent this unsafe situation happening. We prevent it by installing this tra traffic light, for example. And lastly, uh, when very loud things have to happen, for example, in the weekend, we sometimes compensate uh, the people uh, living surrounding our uh, projects, for example, by a free hotel night, something like that. So that's kind of how it works. Which, as you can see, this all sounds quite simple. And that is because you actually can see the entire project almost on this picture. So it's not that uh, much households. And you actually really clearly can see where the construction works are happening and which houses are directly uh, affected. If we then go to the a9 project, we have these statistics. So we have 12 kilometers of highway, but there's almost there's over 100,000 people living very close to this project. It's a contract value of over a billion. So you can also imagine that costs overruns on such a project are not within the thousands, but they're also within the millions. And daily on a daily basis, there are over 150,000 cars passing by. So you can imagine that good uh, uh, context management uh, is actually a key uh, within uh, uh, delivering this project successfully. Um, so once again, you see a map, and on this map, uh, you can actually see the full 12 kilometer trajectory, where we actually do the exact same things. We are drilling, piling, and we have quite a lot of large machinery. But how are we going to uh, kind of inform and keep track of who to inform uh, uh, around this, surrounding this project? So for this, of course, we cannot rely on one person, uh, but we relied on the innovation that we do as a company, and we build a tool for ourselves. So uh, I would like to show you, uh, show you that. Has one of you already worked with GIS before for one of your projects, maybe, or raised fans? Some people in the back, here in the front, okay. Uh, I think it's uh, mostly applied in the uh, real estate courses and in the master uh, courses. Uh, but this is actually a great example of a very clever application of GIS, uh, which is graphic, uh, uh, geographic information uh, systems. And what we did here is actually build uh, a map which plots all of the different kind of activities that cause nuisance within a certain period of time on the map. So what, uh, what this allows us to do is actually go into specific activities, for example, this one. And we see that the area that it affects is actually highlighted on the map. We can also select it and get the details about it. But we also see that there's no uh, direct building in the vicinity of this activity, which is affected uh, by this activity. However, if we go to Another zone, here there's another bridge that we are demolishing and replacing. Uh, and we have this activity, which is the dry excavation to uh, minus four NAP. Cool. If we select that here, 
for example, uh, one of the buildings which is surrounding the site is highlighted. And here we can see that these are the addresses meander 1 till 91. And then we actually have to be very cautious with uh, the zettingsgevoeligheid, which is kind of the compacting of the grounds while we do our works, uh, because this building is of uh, uh, quite an old age. So we have to actually perform additional measurements for the building to stay structurally safe. Uh, and we are also able to notify all the residents uh, that uh, there's work going on, which will affect uh, them directly. Um, of course, this is a clicking tool uh, on a map, but this also allows us to actually do uh, automated, uh, resp uh, automated information mails to all of these uh, people surrounding our project, which of course saves us a lot of time, but also still makes it manageable to inform them all correctly about the works that is going on. If s you guys would like to click through this after the presentation, you're very welcome to uh, come down. Okay. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, it works again. So how do we do this? I'm not going to bother you with a very technical story here, uh, but what we try to do is we pick our tools which are very suitable for information delivery, and those are actually situated on the left side, uh, which is Relatix. By th some of you might have already encountered this as well in some of your courses. Uh, Primavera is something that we use for planning, uh, but of course, within a construction project, there's also a lot of documents associated, so we store those in SharePoint. Uh, and we do all different kinds of standardizations and translations, which you can see in the middle and you can forget immediately. Um, but we create a standardized database with all the information that is associated to the project. And what we do with that is that we actually uh, present that in different types of tooling, which are very suitable for data presentation. Uh, I've shown you one, which was uh, the Arc uh, GIS uh, application that we've developed. But uh, for example, my personal job is to do data visualizations in Power BI. We can very easily see statistics, but also uh, do pattern recognition, all different kinds of quite cool stuff to uh, gain insight and a lot of information. So how does this allow us to kind of disrupt the construction industry? Um, what we see quite often is that we work together with partners and initially they say, okay, I'm producing a lot of information, but within the tools that I produce this information, it's quite hard to actually review it uh, in a structured way. Um, so then they come to us and then we say, okay, we'll try to retrieve it, try to standardize it and uh, make it uh, uh, more readable for you. And then they say, awesome, great. But then they're enthusiastic and they want more. And they ask us, okay, oh, could you add this function or could you add this visualization or could you add this additional analysis? And uh, then we say, okay, yeah, that's possible. But then you have to change your way of working because you're currently not uh, actually producing this information or putting it into the systems right for us to do these kinds of analysis. But if you do so, we can do them. So with this kind of things, we try to make people aware of uh, actually putting in the correct data, putting in data consistently, uh, and actually showing them the awesome possibilities that you can have when you do these kinds of analyses. So we've kind of already told this, we have uh, a very big DPM team, that's what I'm part of. We kind of do the analyses, we do the uh, innovations, we build the dashboards. Uh, then we have people who are actually on the execution of projects, uh, for example, like Lena. And lastly, we have the uh, tendering projects. So those are the people who are actually writing the plans for future projects to be realized and actually for uh, uh, projects to be awarded to a certain construction uh, uh, consortium. But that could be a, a subject for uh, quite another language lecture. So I'm not going to dive into that deeper. So this brings me back to the initial th triangle that we want to focus on. And that's also the lesson that we quite want to give you guys. Uh, if you're ever dealing with project management, most of you will always participate in the multi-project. Uh, never think only about people, never only think about the process, never only think about the technology, but really try to see them as a whole and how they can help each other. If one person does not understand one of these three parts within your group, you're never going to have a fully functional, uh, s yeah, smoothly running group. So really try to get sharp if everybody uh, is on the same page with, them with regards to this kind of like uh, correlation. That brings me to the end. And then I want to highlight uh, two of the upcoming events that we are hosting for you guys as well within the company. 
um, that's a drink lecture, which is quite similar to this, uh, but also dives quite a lot deeper into one of our specific projects, which will probably be the A9 project. Um, so it's very into depth and we'll end with uh, a nice drink. Uh, and the other uh, activity that we are hosting is Graduate Your Own Way. That's something that we uh, started doing last year, where we uh, actually allow students to come by and uh, get advice on how to deal with uh, your graduation committee, mostly. And you're helped by our organizational psych, uh, psychologist, yeah, psychologist, um, who is actually coaching you in how to tackle uh, the cooperation with your graduation committee. Very interesting. Uh, so you can scan the QR code if you're interested, you can subscribe on our website. And that brings me to the end, and I would like to open the floor for questions. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you still have any questions, don't hesitate to come to the front and ask Niels because he's very open for everything. Um, to get your My Future points in the back, there are two papers laying where you need to write your name down and your student number. Uh, don't write anyone else's name down because we, we have people checking it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture and hope to see you in two weeks again. Uh, applying as a job student. Of course, also Lena can answer all of your questions about that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>